Tonight on Rescue 911, these true stories of extreme adversity and overwhelming love. They located coon hunters, campfire, deer, everything but my little girl. And it broke my heart to think of life without her. Teresa let out a yell right from the gut. At that point, there was no denying it, the baby was coming. When we started hitting packed snow and ice, and I slowed down, you, you could see her wanting to straighten out. It's hard to see inside someone else's family, to find what holds it together and what might tear it apart. We begin in rural Georgia. Dwayne Whitten worked long hours, which left little time for his three young children. On November 26, 1994, he decided to take them hiking in the mountains of the Chattahoochee National Forest. Are you guys done? You ready? All right, in the garbage. Got to bear proof it in here. My kids enjoy being outside. Get it. There you go. Matthew, let's go. Let's get our walking sticks. Dwayne had just bought them brand new hiking sticks that week, and they wanted to try it out. Ready? And march. I don't want to. Okay. Let's see. Six-year-old Matthew and his two younger sisters had hiked together before. Yeah, you like this, huh? I like the fresh air up there. The trees. Look how pretty that is. We saw birdies and I saw a little raccoon. Hold on, put you down, baby. I'll tell you what. Let's come over here. Sometimes Rachel and Naomi get tired. Matthew, come on. And so my dad said, let's take a break. You guys can play in the rocks and don't go nowhere, okay? I'm going to go right up here on top of the seal. He said, he'll stay here and play while I'm going to go look for a hog, deer, or bear. I'll be able to see you, but just sit tight, okay? Find me some rocks or something. Find me pretty rocks. He didn't go very far, but we couldn't see him. Turn around. Naomi is gone. Daddy, where's Naomi? When we continue. They located coon hunters, campfire, deer, everything but my little girl. And it broke my heart to think of life without her. When Dwayne Whitten's youngest child, Naomi, disappeared while hiking with her family in the mountains, Lumpkin County's emergency management director, Don Seabolt, was brought in. I got a call that we had a two-year-old lost. What happened? According to the father, he'd done a search of the area and could not find her. Okay, what was your last wear? Um, little hiking boots, purple pants, pink She'd been gone about uh, one hour at that point. Darkness was coming, and it was going to get cold that night. We needed to find her quick. Remember, mark your left flank. Let's go. The second group gets signed in and form up on me. We decided to go ahead with a full-blown search. Team leader, I want you to mark your left flank, okay? Line search. All right, move in. Make sure to face the other flank. Naomi! We were trying to search about 1,500 feet radius to start with. 
creek for any holes in the bank. There you go. Stay on me. Stay on me. County Sheriff Jimmy Berry was also at the scene. The incident in South Carolina where the mother was involved in the disappearance of her children it had only been a few weeks prior to that. Hey, my name's Jimmy Berry. I'm the when we didn't find the child within a reasonable distance, we began to suspect foul play. We could not be 100% sure that the father was being truthful. We had to speculate the worst. As the sun was setting, the weather was getting colder. At night, you have almost got to walk shoulder to shoulder, or you're going to miss something. Rain's coming in. Myrna Whitten had been at work when she learned her baby was missing. Yes. This is the mother. Oh, okay. What tore me up the most was just to think of her out there by herself. Just crying. We're trying our best. I didn't want her thinking that mommy abandoned her. I know she's cold and hungry. I just, I prayed for God to, you know, send angels to protect her. The National Guard had an infrared helicopter come in to assist us on this search. They located coon hunters, campfire, deer, everything but my little girl. My emotions got real, real low, thinking that somebody has taken this little girl. We'd been over these areas too much. She was not there. No, sir, so it's just like I told you. I was interrogated for hours. It was incredibly frustrating, You're telling us you but um, I cooperated simply because it was my little one. I love her with every fiber of my being, as much as humanly possible, and then some. I wanted her found. Temperature was in the 40s. We did not know for sure whether she could even make it with a temperature that low. All that kept coming back to my mind is the night before Thanksgiving. I let the kids tell me what they're thankful for. And Matthew had told me he was thankful for his sisters. And it broke my heart to think of life without her. Keep your spirits up. That's what we're looking for. We gotta find And this morning crept up on us. The volunteers that we had were totally, totally exhausted. Hot to drink, we'll get you back out there, okay? I knew we had to get fresh bodies in. Let's go. Okay, uh what Don told me... Don called Barry Church, the emergency management director of nearby Habersham County. Oh, uh, she's been missing about 12 hours. We have used a computer program a number of times when we've had missing persons in our area. And I told him we'll be more than happy to see what it will tell us. Okay, guys. First thing that I need to know is how many are trained as EMTs, first responders? By morning, more than 250 people were searching for the missing girl, including high angle rescue team member Kip Clayton. The computer scenario told us that instinctively the two year old little girl would try to climb to the highest point she could get to, but she would uh, more than likely be not much further than 2,000 feet from where she was last seen. Also, because of the time she'd been in the woods, the weather, the chances of finding her alive were pretty slim. Shane Lively, a firefighter in another county, had also volunteered to help search. The computer had predicted that Naomi could be anywhere that could give her shelter from the weather. There had been a tornado that came through the year before. We were supposed to start in the middle of that area and come back to where she was lost from. So I'll go up over there, but next Kip the decided to go to the back edge and start there, seeing as how there were that many more trees down that she could have been laying behind. Tim, boy, we're just about positioned. How y'all looking? We're lined up and ready to go. Y'all start moving up. 
Okay, we're moving. All right, y'all start moving, guys. Be, be careful. Oh my God, there she is, there she is. I got her, I got her. Whoa, stop, no, no. I gotta check her. She was bloated. Just looking at her, I thought she was gone. Don't touch her. I knew that it would be considered a crime scene, that they would want it as untouched as possible. But then I heard a whimper. God, she's alive. Give me a vehicle. Back here now. Get it back here now. Hey. That was the happiest words I have ever heard in my whole life. That she was alive still. And that I would be able to see my little girl again. She wasn't moving. Naomi, sweetheart. And she was, she was cold. She was so cold. And she was a, a purple color. Sweetheart. She had bubbles coming out of her mouth where she was trying to breathe. It's just, see a little girl like that, she wouldn't. It's not possible. Possible. Sweetheart. I got a pulse. We got a pulse. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Come on, sweetheart. Come on, sweetheart. Get us a vehicle. We're going to meet you at the road. Come on. Come on, sweetheart. Come on. Let's go. I'm trying to keep her making noises. I'm trying to do anything. Just to. Reassure yourselves that, just, you know, you did find her. She is alive. Hurry up, Simon! Two-year-old Naomi Witten had been lost in the woods for nearly 24 hours when she was found on the edge of the area the computer had predicted. It was just like a thousand pounds had been lifted off everybody's shoulders. I didn't know how alive she was, but at least she had been found. To see the emotion that was felt just for a stranger it was unbelievable. At nearby St. Joseph's Hospital of Dahlonega, Naomi was examined by emergency physician Thomas Rickner. Her core temperature was around 70 degrees as best we could determine. She was severely dehydrated and she had no blood pressure and no palpable pulse. Dry her and get our blankets on her. I knew that she could hear me, so I, I said, your daddy's here and I, and I love you. And she looked up at me and she recognized me and she began to cry. She busted out crying and it was one of the sweetest moments in my entire life. I knew she was coming around. Remarkably, Naomi came through the ordeal with no permanent injuries. You ready? I felt really bad having lost her. She did suffer, and that hurts me as, as a parent not being able to protect her. Me and Michael like to play with her. I love Naomi this much. I'm glad she's okay. Who is that? All the rescuers and all the searchers, I want you to know that I am so grateful to y'all. Next time I ever hear of anyone missing, I'm going to be the first one out there to look. <laughs> Being part of finding her really is something I'll never forget. That's just a special event like going to the Olympics or something. That was that was my Olympics. I gotcha. Because people poured out their love, we received our little love back again. Next. Oh my God. Nine one emergency.
ready to open? Yeah, go ahead. I'll try to keep an eye on it. On June 28, 1993, 22-year-old Candace Crossland was the manager on duty at a fast food restaurant in Mesa, Arizona, as they were opening up around 6 a.m. Annette Pfeiffer was also on the early shift that morning. Candace was so young and vibrant. She worked with kids in gang prevention. She taught Sunday school, and she had all these goals for herself. It was just really weird when it happened. So your vacation is coming tomorrow, and you're going to go? Don't let me forget. I'll give you a dollar, and you can put it on 13 red. Who's in charge here? We thought he was the air conditioner repairman. We were waiting for somebody to come and fix it. Oh my God, he's Take where she is now. Oh, no. My God, Candace, The only thing he said in front of us again was, you come on towards Candace. He had the gun, you come on. And then he says, you two stay here. Can you see anything? Queen and I were holding hands and praying and then we started to talk about, you know, God, he won't, he won't shoot Candace, he won't shoot Candace. You know, this is, he's just going to take the money and go. Come on. Oh, my God. Dino, an emergency. Yes. Mesa Police Dispatcher Chris Muma was handling the call. Usually at 6 o'clock in the morning, it's a medical call, but not a violent shooting and robbery like that. And this one kind of caught me off guard. Okay. We're, we're, Ma'am, we're on our way. You need to stay on the phone with me, okay? Rescue units were immediately dispatched to the scene, including Mesa Fire Department paramedic Kevin Mashu. You get a lot of the same calls and you don't remember them, but this one was affected me a little more because I had been in the restaurant business and I had actually been uh, held at gunpoint in a robbery. She breathing? Nurse is always bleeding back. You, what you need to do is kind of apply some pressure to it. To it was hard when I saw the blood. It was on the floor and it was just like a puddle. It was it was deep and it was a lot. We were in the back. This had a gun on us. Okay. And what did he say? He told us to go into the walk-in and call our supervisor to come out. And Okay, if things gonna be okay, you're doing real good, all right? They're on their way. They're gonna be there in just a minute. We've got we've got paramedics on the way to help her, okay? Do you hear a car leave at all? I, we didn't hear anything except the shot. Just a shot? Yeah. Okay, is she still conscious and talking to you? No, we're not blessed. Okay. Yeah, just sit her down against the wall. Employee Queena Curtis had taken over the call. She told me to have her sit down, but Candace didn't want to sit down. She just kept throwing up blood. And put the towel up to her neck. Press kind of hard to try to stop the bleeding, okay? All right, everything's going to be okay. Are you almost here? Yes, there's two officers there. Paramedics are going to be there in just a minute, okay? You just need to stay on the phone with me. All right? What's your name, ma'am? Queena? I'm sorry? Queena? Queena? The officers are here. Okay. Are the officers inside with you? Okay, we're here. All right. He had um, dark hair. She's been shot in, in, brown the, eyes. in the back of the neck. I was impressed just with the fact that this patient had been shot in the head and, and was still conscious. And she did have a severe shot. It wasn't like it was a glancing blow. It was, it passed right through her, right through her skull. Looks like we got a bullet lodged in the jaw here. You know where you're at right now, Candace? Yeah, I'm at work. The first police officer on the scene was Bon Gonzales. Had you ever seen him before, Candace? I worked with him. Okay. Here she knew who he was. They had worked for the same restaurant in the past. Set up a crime scene log and evidence. Then, like five minutes to ten minutes after this happened, we were sending officers to his past addresses. 120. Keep spitting that blood out, Candace. It was obvious that she hit a large artery or vein, and I was concerned that her airway was going to be compromised. So uh, what I opted to do was just get her down on the ground on all fours. Candace's mother, Gloria Crossland, heard about the shooting on her police scanner. 
They wouldn't tell me who was shot, so I sneaked around to the front window and found out it was Candace. I mean, I was petrified. It was horrible, you know, because here's this 20-some-year-old who's doing all these things to, to better her community and, you know, working a terrible job, making terrible wages, no insurance, no benefits. And something like this happens. This jerk. I think he got, you know, $1,500 or some measly sum like that. You know, what's the point? I had seen the blood and her on the stretcher. And I thought, oh my God, she was born six months after her father died. And uh, it's just one of those things. You're close that way. 22-year-old Candace Crossland was taken by Samaritan Air Evac helicopter to Scottsdale Memorial Hospital and examined by emergency physician Pierre Gilles. The bullet traversed across to the right side of her neck, close to her windpipe. She was fortunate that the initial uh, effect of the gunshot wound did not kill her. Okay, that's good. She was equally fortunate that the swelling effects and the blast effects also did not leave her with any uh, permanent neurologic injury. Doctors spent hours in surgery repairing her damaged carotid artery. After four days, Candace was released from the hospital. More than a year has passed since the shooting. The bullet is under the fatty tissue, under my chin. And it just sits there, it doesn't move. It just sits there, it's kind of hard, it feels like a pee. You're out, give me the ball. You're out, give me the ball. <laughs> I'm a little more paranoid, but I still work in uh, prevention at-risk kids, because I don't think that it's fair to them to take away what they need from me. She still works at the restaurant, and she's going to college next semester. She wants to be a teacher in the reservation, so she's going on the way it was. The suspect was subsequently convicted of armed robbery and attempted second-degree murder, and sentenced to 29 years in prison. If he's in his late 50s, by the time he gets out, that's justice for me, because I'll be in my late 50s, too, and hopefully a little bit forget about this as I'm on 50. I asked her, you want to come and help me put wallpaper in? Yeah, She right. goes, no, I get my house in two weeks. If she hadn't made it through this ordeal, I'd have been devastated. They'd have probably taken me to Arizona State Hospital. And if it hadn't been for 911, she would have died, because they were there that quick. They saved her, they put her on a helicopter, they took her where she needed to go, and it was still touchy after that. But she made it, because it was Candace. The fact that she had the strength to go and call 911 herself, this hole in her neck, bullet in her face, was just unreal to me. Definitely a hero. Definitely. Without a doubt. Next, when we started hitting packed snow and ice, and ice slowed down, you, you could see her wanting to straighten out. When Dale Criswell and his 20-year-old daughter, Darcy, set out from Coos Bay, Oregon on March 21, 1994, their 400-mile trip across the state was to be a new beginning for her and her 13-month-old daughter. But along the way, everything suddenly changed. I have to. <laughs> your mom will be behind me and you'll be up there with me, okay? This was just going to be a, a quick trip for me to go over to Bend and come back the same day. And then go on up over the mountain, all right? My daughter was moving over to Bend to continue her uh, education in the nursing program over there and work her way through college. I was more coordinated to driving with one hand and dealing with the baby with the other hand than Darcy was, so I just decided, well, we'll just put the baby in my vehicle and that'll uh, make things a little bit easier on Darcy when it comes time to go over the pass. Inside the radio. Oh. Oh. Is the load the best? 
back, your uh, vehicle stable, you're not slipping too much area. No, I can see, it's fine. Okay, just remember we're gonna get into some uh, slippery conditions up here, it's gonna be packed snow and ice. We started hitting packed snow and ice, and I slowed down. I like to keep her in my rear view mirror. See that? How far do we have to go still? Well, we have about another uh, two hours or so before we get to bed. You could see her wanting to straighten out, but she just clipped the end of the guardrail. I thought maybe she didn't go all the way. Maybe she got hung up on some boulders that would have stopped her. What's the baby? That's when I bail off the side of the hill all the way down, I'm calling for her and calling for her, and she's not responding. Darcy! And I'm thinking in my mind, oh God, don't let her be dead. Don't let her be dead. Darcy! It's a big weight lifted off your shoulders, knowing that, hey, she's alive and there's still a chance to get her out. That's when the engine caught on fire. We expected that's that's a nice area up there. Dan Tenninger and his cousin happened to be driving the same road. You can see skid marks going right off the edge of the cliff. There's a car over the bank. Like a low one, I'm going down. Looked like someone smoldering fire down there. You couldn't see nothing. But I didn't want to be a spectator and just watch it burn from the top of the cliff. Police fire and ambulance, do you have an emergency? Yes, I do. Um the car went off a cliff here, up on Highway 58, up on the pass. I just stopped. It's on fire. Highway 58, do you know what mile post you're at? I'm, I'm not sure what mile... The cellular call initially came in to the Eugene EMS Center, 55 miles away. Okay. Oh, man, those people are dead. Hang in there, Darcy. I had to cut her out of her seatbelt. You don't want to move a person with a back injury. But I can feel the heat of the flames on, on my back. I didn't know if the gas tank was going to explode. I knew she had at least a half a tank of gas. It's okay. I got to get you up. Fortunately, her feet were not tangled up in anything. I was able to utilize the seat and keeping her her body as rigid as possible. Pull her out as straight as I can. Please. I know. The rocks were the size of Volkswagens. We were slipping and falling. A tire exploded. Boom! We didn't know what it was. We jumped a little bit. Oak Ridge Fire and Ambulance Units were immediately dispatched, but they were more than 20 minutes away. And what kind of vehicle? Car? Okay, they, they got the guy out. Don't move him! Don't move him, Dad! Who got the guy out? Who's with him? Uh, my buddy, he, uh, he's dragging the guy. Don't move him! He could have a broken leg or, or something in his neck or back! Do you, know, not, if, do huh? you know if the person is conscious or breathing? I can't tell. Um, let me find out. Is he okay? Is he alive? Dan! The girl. The patient is a female. Is she conscious? Yes, she's crying. We weren't, but maybe 15, 20 feet away, and the flames had just engulfed the vehicle. 
the whole left side of her body had taken a beating. And there was a lot of blood covering the left side of her face. She said, Dad, I'm not afraid to die. We just kind of held our hands together and prayed for her. Lord, give us strength to make it. She was more concerned about her baby than uh, she was for herself. Devin was up at the top of the hill. The baby wouldn't have survived the accident. The temperature had dropped to about 20 degrees. She was going into hypothermia. And there was bags of clothes that had fallen out of her car. So we broke open the bags of clothes, started packing her in these clothes, trying to make her as comfortable as we could. EMT Mark Leverton was one of the first medics on the scene. I looked down the hill and said, oh my God, you know, what are we going to do? I didn't think anybody could live through something like that. And I saw probably some of the worst conditions for rescue that you could have. We're going to need a lot of bodies for picking up and putting her in the soap. You had steep ground, you had slippery ground. It was going to be a brute force show. We've got a year on the head. You stabilize okay. the head. We need two people on shoulders, two people on hips, two people on legs. We're going to pick her up as a unit, put her in. Okay. She kept asking me, how far did I go down? I thought maybe they'd put her in shock. She actually knew how far she fell. So I didn't want to tell her, yeah, you just went three, four hundred feet over a cliff. You know, and you're all busted up. She had some obvious outward signs of cuts and scrapes and bruises, but along with those come internal injuries, which are the silent killers. Gonna go to your right a little bit. There were three times up the hill where she got real quiet and real limp, and I thought she was gone. But every time she was a fighter, she came back. Two and a half hours after the crash, Darcy was finally pulled out of the ravine. I still had about a 75-mile drive into St. Charles Hospital in Bend. Your first instinct is to hurry, but I had to remember I still had my granddaughter with me, and I didn't want another accident to happen. It was probably the longest 75 miles that I could have driven. 20-year-old Darcy Criswell was transferred to an Air Life helicopter and taken to St. Charles Medical Center, where neurosurgeon Mark Belsa took over her care. Good to see you. She's been down a little while. She's a little bit cool, but she's moving all around. She had a uh, fractured spine. She had a uh, fractured left elbow. She had a fractured foot, a bruised lung, a perforated lung. Look over here. She could have had a lot worse. She could have been thrown from the vehicle and died. Uh, Darcy could have been uh, killed by fire. She came uh, within a half an inch of being paralyzed in the waist down because of her spinal fracture. I didn't really realize the impact of the accident until I see my daughter laying in, I, uh, in ICU. I must have stayed there quite late just waiting for her to go to sleep. A year has passed. I kind of believe that things happen for a purpose. It's like, what exactly am I supposed to be learning from this? I mean, was this really necessary? She'll never be able to be a floor nurse because of her back injury, the weakness in her arm. The requirements are you, you have to lift, I think, 50 pounds to be able to lift that. She's just now getting to the point where she can lift her daughter. But she's very determined. She's known since she was eight years old that she was going to go to college. I am glad that I wore my seatbelt. And I'm really thankful that there were people there to help me. There was a state trooper down there. He actually let me wear his hat for a while. <laughs> He said I earned it. I was sore for days. But it's always good to have a save. And this is one that I put in my top five. My dad, to me, was a hero. I think as kids and teenagers, people don't um, appreciate their parents. 
they just kind of forget what all the parents do for them. And it, uh, it made me really stop and think. Next, Teresa let out a yell right from the gut. At that point, there was no denying it, the baby was coming. Teresa DeBera was nearing the end of her sixth month of pregnancy when she, her husband Sandy, and their three-year-old daughter set out to enjoy one last relaxing vacation before the baby was born. On November 23, 1994, they boarded a flight in New York bound for Orlando, Florida, thinking they were leaving all their worries behind. Teresa woke up with slight pain in her abdomen. What she thought was maybe indigestion. She spoke to one of the obstetricians and she said, I'm leaving for Orlando. What do you think? And he goes, good luck, have a good time. <laughs> Fifteen, twenty minutes into the flight, the pain started becoming progressively oh. more intense and more frequent. Sandy got the attention of flight service manager Meg Somerville. The first question came out of my mouth. I said, are you pregnant? And then very soft voice, but it's only six months. He didn't look pregnant at all. Sir, do you mind to back at those seats? We have some seats around the corner. Ladies and gentlemen, we are looking for a physician. If you Dr. Stephen Racklin, an internist from Long Island, happened to be on board. James and Jen Midgley were seated a few rows behind the DeBerras. A stewardess is walking by, and I stopped her, and I told her that my husband and I were both paramedics if they needed any help. She told me at that time that they had a physician and that they were all set. So she told me that she's expecting baby. Initially, she didn't look too bad. She told me that she had the same false contractions with her first child. I'm okay. But I really had no training in obstetrics. And then she said she felt moisture. Get the flight attendant. We have a problem. Jerry, this is Meg. Jerry McFerrin was the captain of Flight 265. Once she started bleeding, I thought, well, that does it. We're going to have to divert. So I just immediately went into a right-hand turn because I knew we were passing by Dulles Airport. Gloves, blankets, towels. Right. Teresa let out a yell right from the gut, and I was, I was totally uh, devastated at that point. Almost there. That's it. Coming in really fast. Huh? There's really very little medical equipment knowing that the baby was a preterm. I really did not know if the baby was going to survive. At that point, there was no denying it, the baby was coming. But when the baby came out, the umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck and he was blue. So it was obvious to everybody that there was something terribly wrong. Baby, baby. Flight attendant Connie Duquette had helped with the delivery. And the baby's just draped over the doctor's hand, and the doctor was slapping the baby and going, breathe, baby, breathe, and the baby wasn't breathing. And that was really hard to see. And it went on and on. The captain called over the PA, 10 seconds to touch down. The baby just wasn't breathing, wasn't breathing. Um, and then it just got down to a litany of, please, God, please, God. I knew from, from my vantage point, something had changed. My husband and I are both paramedics if you need help. My wife said that, you know, we were trained in emergency childbirth and pediatric resuscitation. Being the forceful one in the family, she felt something was wrong and she felt that she could help. When I got up there, the doctor looked up at me and said he didn't think the baby was going to make it. He actually wasn't breathing at all, and the heart rate was extremely low. Do you have anything for suction? Infants are nose breathers, so I asked for a straw or something to suction. One of the stewardess had brought a juice box from home and brought me the straw still in the wrapper. Come on, baby. Come on, baby, breathe. I didn't want to cause a lot of trauma. This was a very small infant. 
but I just inserted the straw until I met a little bit of resistance and sucked out some of the fluid that was in there. The baby was very blue. I don't know how else to describe it, but just very blue. Continue CPR. You need to get something to mouth to mouth. Strength. Newborns, as soon as they're born, we give them a rating on a scale of one to ten. It's called NAPCAR. Ten is great, perfect newborn. Zero is dead. The baby had a NAPCAR of one. Come on, keep going. Doing cardiac percussion. My wife had already started mouth to mouth, and the heart rate had not increased. So at that point, we decided to initiate cardiac compressions as well. This taxi seemed like it went on forever. And at that point, doctor said, I've got to tie and cut this cord. I was already on my knees with the mother, so I just dropped on all fours and started crawling down the aisle looking at people's shoelaces. And then I saw this man with a brand new pair of lace-up shoes on, brand new. I thought these are perfect. Let's get ready to tie the cord off. It became very quiet, very solemn. Come on, let's go, you can do it. You could Come hear on. a pin drop by that You're point. Breathing. I was terrified like I had never been terrified. I was convinced that he was not going to make it. And that's when the baby finally breathed and he let out a little whimper. And we went from a mood of defeat to a, a, a total rejoicing there. So I just picked up the PA and I yelled, it's a boy. And the whole plane started cheering and people were crying and it was great. Dad came over and gave me a big hug. It was like uh, a miracle. I remember people in the cabin clapping, although I didn't think there was much to clap about at that point. I mean, I, it, it wasn't like, uh, you know, I had won the Stanley Cup or anything. 35-year-old <laughs> Teresa DeBera and her newborn baby boy were taken to Reston Hospital Center in Washington, D.C., where neonatologist James Davis examined the infant. It was just a very extremely immature baby. He was still struggling by just looking at his chest. He was uh, having some struggles with breathing, and so we knew that we had some problems. As we are coming into the hospital, the two EMTs that took the baby to the hospital are coming out, and... Uh, that's when they uh, told us that he would probably be okay. You about ready to go, buddy? Mm -hmm. okay. Born nearly three months premature, the baby weighed just four pounds, six ounces. The mother was still receiving some care, and uh, we didn't just want to call him baby. So since he was born at Dulles Airport, we just started calling him Dulles. There you go. Squeeze just a little bit. There you go. While we had not discussed any names for the baby in particular, we got a kind of a kick out of that baby Dulles, and so therefore we got Matthew Dulles to bear. Amazingly, after only three weeks in the hospital, Matthew was released in good health, just in time to go home for Christmas. Thank you so much. Merry Christmas. The folks at Reston Hospital will forever be in our hearts and in our prayers. Good luck. Recently, the DeBera family got a chance to be reunited with all the people who helped with baby Matthew's unusual delivery. It was nice to see the baby. He looked extremely healthy. He was and was full of life, which was nice to see because that's not the way he came into this world. Can I hold him? Sure. Hey. Absolutely. Absolutely. We weren't originally scheduled to be on this flight at all. I'm proud that we're part of the reason that he's here. And I'll probably be keeping tabs on him for the rest of his life. <laughs> the rest of mine, anyway. How's he been doing since he came home? Uh, he's gained two pounds. These people were like two angels that were just dropped in this airplane by God. I mean, they were destined to be there, I guess. Dr. Ackland kept me calm and focused. He's a nutritionist, but he <laughs> makes pretty good emergency GYN, too. Hello, 
Matthew. Matthew Doe. <laughs> we, we departed with 213 souls on board, and uh, then we landed with 214. Let me see our baby. Our baby. Our baby. Our baby. <laughs> the epilogue of this. Well, we had many children on the airplane, and the children were saying that they now know where babies come from. They come from airplanes. <laughs> I can't think that Matthew was meant to be born any place but on that airplane. I, I can only think that he's destined for good things. I don't know what those good things are. If he's going to be a, a Nobel Prize winner or if he's going to be just a really good bus driver. But he's destined for very good things. Yes. Okay. Oh, right. Big kiss. <laughs> Big kiss. <laughs>